and here we are i think we're on live You're right okay yeah perfect hey everybody um yeah thanks Hi. everybody for joining um this is the yeah first public version of the acv meetup by biped uh, we're very happy that you're here and we are even more happy that uh, Thibaut volunteer, volunteered to give us a great talk about uh, real-time practical Monoluca 3D perception through spatial temporal consistency. And I would say I'll just leave the stage to you, Thibaut, to introduce yeah. the topic and um, yeah, have fun. Great. Uh, thanks a lot and thanks for everyone to joining this presentation. Uh, I am Thibaut Neveu, the CTO at a CTO at Visual Behavior, we're working on robotics perceptions. So our goal is to give robots some kind of scene understanding that they can use to perform action, doing motion planning and controls and so on, using only cameras uh, so that we can scale properly. Um, so I'm gonna try to introduce you how we work on monocular 3D perceptions. So using only one camera and how we use different kind of uh, inductive bias so to make it so that our models can run faster. So I'm going to introduce six six by four that we use and stick to the end because the fourth one is really impressive. <laughs> so, okay, so I'm just going to start to show you like a, basically what monocular uh, perception is. So this is one you know, pr um, demonstration that we did at the CES uh, one month ago. Uh, so what we can see is a racing car that is following someone. And what we see if I play stop, uh, pause, what we can see there is, uh, on the upper right corner, the monocular perception that is embedded onto a Jetson. And we have the detect, the floor, which is detected. So this is all the, the, the driver board area. And we have here the near obstacles, uh, in front of, uh, of the car. So that was one small presentation that we did. Also, I don't know if how you works with the question. Uh, if we wait uh, until the end, or I guess yeah, if uh, how you prefer. Uh, if, um... Yeah, gradually. So as soon as there's one question, uh, everybody can just uh, jump in. Yeah. Okay. Could be great. Doing like this. Okay, so that was like a, basically an introduction of what monocular uh, perception is embedded onto a Jetson. Um, okay. We move on. So on this demonstration, uh, it was running on, on the Jackson Xavier. It was running at uh, 40 FPS with uh, roughly 358 uh, pixels per, per 358 images. And so we're currently working to make those kind of models to work even on smaller hardware, like uh, for example, the Jetson Nano. And we expect that we can probably uh, reach something like 10 FPS using a variety of methods that I will introduce in, uh, in this presentation. Um, okay, so uh, just to go back to, to the basics uh, so that we can understand properly the concepts that we'll talk after uh, is a, Asking the question is about how mammal, uh, so in general, is not like not only human being, but all mammals perceive the depth and sane understanding around. So there is different, uh, a lot of different uh, mechanisms that we as human beings use and also mammals use to perceive depths. Uh, the first one that is uh, usually leveraged by stereo camera is stereo, the fact that we have two highs. And so by using the disparity between the two highs, we can have a feeling of how far or how close something is from the camera. That's one very common thing, but sometimes in robotics, it can be a struggle to work with that because you have to be sure that uh, your lens will always align properly. And if at some point, uh, you know, it, it's warming or maybe after one or two years, your lens can slightly move. And if it happens, then your robot is messed up, but you can't rely on stereo anymore. So that, that's sometimes one of the struggle uh, people uh, have with stereo camera. Then there is the semantic world of just trying to perceive depth using only uh, semantic information. So using color, blur, textures, perspective, this is a or a bunch of clues that we can use to uh, know the depth into an image. And this is what those monocular network use. Then there is some other concepts like that we use as optical expansion. This is this notion of if something is moving very fast in front of you in the axis, so in that direction, if you see something coming or if you're walking and you have like, for example, a wall in front of you 
optical expansion is the process by which you will rely on optical flow to measure how fast something is coming to you. This is sometimes also referred to as time to contact, so the time for an object to hit the camera. And this is something very interesting to use because it do, do not need multiple cameras. The only, need, the only thing you, know, you need is one camera on having some kind of motion that you can uh, leverage so that you can deduce in how many time the, these things will hit your camera. Then you have this notion of parallax. So this is like if I move like this uh, and I look at my scene, even though I have only one eye, I can still try to see how does the world behave. Uh, I, I, by, by using this bias, I will know if something is very far because it will not move a lot in, from my perspective. But if something is very close, it's gonna move a lot when I'm gonna move like this. So by using these facts, you can know how far, how, how far something is. Um, you have saccadic attention, so you can try to refer to different points uh, in the image. Motion blur, uh, I'm not gonna go uh, too much into the details, but if you move very uh, fast into one direction, uh, the blur that you see in the image is proportional to the distance uh, at the, uh, of the point. So um, how to, pre to perceive depth with one eye? So most of the, the stuff that we see, um, I mean, the most popular models when we talk about monocular perception rely on semantic information. So they leverage, so they can't use stereo. Uh, most of the time they, they use semantics and, and semantic clues like color, blur, texture, and perspective to deduce how far something is. Yeah, someone just jump in. Okay. So, one set of the earth, uh, one of the set of the earth's monocular depth perception models uh, is vision transformers for dense prediction. Um, maybe this is not the state of the earth right now because it moved so quickly that maybe this is not anymore. I don't know. But I mean, a few months back, it, it was the state of the earth. Um, so it's these models rely only on semantic. So you have one image and they use some kind of embedding like the VIT model is doing with transformers and then they pass that to some VIT blocks, transformers, and they predict depth informations. And what they show is by relying on transformers, they can have more precise and dense informations, more accurate information on depth map. Um, they also have an, an hybrid model when they use both ResNets, a ResNet model for the backbone, and for the uh, transformers with VIT blocks on top of that to predict uh, depth information. So, um, so I'm gonna try to give you some insight about what's wrong with these models. So there is many things that make it so that we can't use it as it is to go in production. Um, the first thing is the way that they train the models. Um, what they do is that they train a loss with inverse depth. So not bad and up to now, but what they do is that they try to normalize the ground truth. So the normalization is made as such that you will try to get rid of uh, the, scale and the shift of the scene. So what it means is that what the model is predicting is the inverse depth with up to scale and shift ambiguity. So if you use that with a robot, it means that, well, you know that's how things are relative to each other, but you don't know exactly in an absolute manner how far they are from your robots. So in some cases it can be useful, but if you're doing things like obstacle avoidance or uh, other kind of stuff, stuff, it can very get tricky. Um, because at the end, when you're going to use your model at inference, it means that you, the predicted depth that you will use have to, if you really want depth information, you have to rely on some scale and shift that you don't know. You don't know those things. You can know them if you have a LiDAR, for example, in, uh, just next to your camera, or you have some external information to guide you. But if you just use one monocular camera, you will just not, don't know those kind of information. So the main issue, if I try to summarize, is that you don't know the scale and the shift. Uh, the model can be slow. There, I mean, even, even the hybrid models, there is a, a ResNet plus uh, a VIT blocks, and that can be extremely slow to run on the on, on the JSON or some embedded hardware. And you have a lack of temporal consistency. So it means that the scale and shift that the model is, pro is providing 
uh, will not be constant. So on each frame, you're not guaranteed that you will have a consistent uh, eye depth because the scale can vary a lot. And so it can make extremely hard to use those kind of information if you want to do, to do mapping or localization with the depth that, that is provided by the model. So if we try to take a, take a step back and try to think about how we can go from monocular uh, depth perception from research to production, there is a lot of things to improve, but also a lot of method that we can try to rely on. So instead of relying only on semantic, we can try to leverage all the other mechanisms that we use as human beings to perceive the, a scene, which is optical flow, parallax, saccadic attention, motion blur, and consistent topological prior. And we can try to optimize uh, this architecture so, so that the backbone and the VIT blocks uh, can run faster on embedded hardware. Is there maybe some uh, question before uh, I jump in, into? Nope. Okay, so first, one of the first methods that um, we use to make that network to go faster is to use what we call guided attention. So the VIT blocks, uh, rely on attention mechanisms. So we too much into the details. What they do is that they try to patch, uh, to create a, a, a series of patch on the image. Uh, and what they do is that for each query, uh, they try to do the dot product. So they create an attention mask that they can use to aggregate the value from the networks. And by doing so, this is why Attention, sometimes I refer to be better or sometimes uh, good to, to, to put at the end or after some convolution is because you can have this global context and you can dynamically choose the kernel values on how you're going to aggregate the values. But uh, the thing is, if you do that for all your layers, if you're running the attention for all your layers, uh, this operation, the query, uh, the query, when you do the dot products between the query and the key, that operation is extremely costly. Uh, this is something like a 30 three percent of the attention block is, is, is made by this part. Um, so what we what we do is that we use instead of with the guided attention. So this is one thing that we can use is, uh, is that instead of computing each time at each layer an attention, so a dot product between the query and the key, we, what you can do is to optimize that process so that we don't do not each time compute that things, but we rely on the previous uh, dot products in the previous layers. So by doing so, you still leverage the dynamic kernel attention made by transformers, but you try to more efficiently reuse this type of information in the, in the multiple layers that you use. Yeah. Can I ask one question? Yeah. Uh, this attention is only, this is not over time, right? This is only the attention inside the one yes, input image. Exactly. Like in the, in the architecture, you have multiple blocks. Yeah. Uh, so uh, multiple attention blocks as well. And so what you, what you want to do is to compute as less query time, do, time query as yeah. possible. And so you try to use the previous one. Yeah. And just uh, out of curiosity, because it just comes to my mind, I'm not sure if it makes a lot of sense, but did you try to just do it, like see what is the difference between doing it very early in the network to have a bit cheaper attention? Why? Because the... Um, yeah. yeah. Like what, the, what the networks do is that it's it's really doing different uh, kernel attention each at each layer. Yeah. But if we force the networks to come up with a fewer with fewer kernel attentions, uh, it will try to find a way to to make it more efficient, since we, you are not gonna lose a lot of 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 accuracy at the end. Okay, so reducing the amount of attention um, blocks, so to say, is actually like a positive thing or like a equally good thing? Uh, it's like a closely equal, a, all, almost equal things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And well, the, well, what you can, par the parameters that you change is yeah. on how many attention blocks you compute again, you can, your attention kernel. Okay, thank you. So that is, so just to say that is one way that we can optimize the attention, uh, the attention uh, mechanisms. But there is a lot of, uh, there is a myriad of paper that show how we can uh, leverage better attention without relying on doing the query, the dot product between all the, the key and query pairs. So that is one thing that we can do, but there is a lot of others. So, but that, that's one avenue. 
The second one is to use efficient depth refinements. So as I mentioned, we have multiple VIT blocks. And what is going to happen is that for each new block, we are going to compute a new value for each part of the image each time, no matter if this value is already good or not. And it comes at cost. Like I, I made, so here is one ex uh, example to show that on the left here, uh, like the depth maybe after the first VIT block. So this is very rough example. Of course, this is not a realistic one. But what could happen is that you have some value that already converge towards a good value, a proper one. But some other value might need some more computation so that they can run more effectively, uh, so, so, can, so that they can be more accurate. And so instead of computing the attention on, like instead of updating each token, you will try to filter out the tokens that you will use at the next block so that your model which only makes the refinements on the part of the, of the image that have to pro that have to move forward, and what you do to know which key to select, you will ask the network to predict for each token, am I drawn, or can I still improve that part of the of the image? So this is where what we I illustrate on the middle here is that for those for those part of the image we still need to improve. So the only part where we're gonna update. Uh, we're going to run our attention are going to be on those parts. And this is what we call here the refund guided attention, where we filter uh, exactly the, the, the value that we're going to update, as well as which on which dot product we rely on. Which kind of makes sense on this comeback as well on this idea of psychedelic attention. We have this uh, potential as human being where we move our eyes to carry some information from one part of the image. and if we know that something is is far away and we don't care about it, we don't have to look it look look again at that part of the image. We don't care about it. But if something is very close and we want to be more accurate, like, a, like maybe we want to do that for obstacle avoidance, for example, in robotics, then it's got, it's becoming very important to maybe look more on that part of the image instead of updating everything. And so by doing so, we can extremely reduce the computational uh, efficiency of, of the model as we progress into the VIT blocks. Does it make sense? Yes. Yeah. Great. So that was the, the second avenue. Let's move to the third one is to introduce this recurrent formulation. Um, so let's say we have here, a static scene, and we are moving the camera uh, in the scene. So there is a prior that the scene is constant, of course. Uh, I mean, there is some kind of consistency in the scene, which may be true in the robotics context. Um, if we do that, uh, the camera might be moving on, on this picture from here, uh, from here to here, like, like that. But what it means is that the networks are, at time t plus one already compute most of the information that we have into the image. Like there is not a lot of novelty into the image. This is mostly the same thing. There is just some new information that pop in on the top, but we can leverage a lot from the, the previous information that we already have to deduce what's here. And we just have maybe to compute here at the top of the hairs that might need some slightly more computation. Um, so it's, if we mix this recurrent formulation with the previous point just before, it means that the networks can use most of the information that he already computed before and leverage that information to just compute the new information that come into the image and make some refinements. And um, this is why also like when you go from step T plus one, from step T to step T plus one, you have to transform somehow the, the representation that you have to a new representation. You can do that in, in two ways. In two way. The first one, you can do it manually. Like if we, if you have a robot and you know some, somehow how, the, how is the ego motion of the robot, you can manually transform your feature map or your representation of the world. So that is going to be more close from what is, should, should, should happen into that world. Or you can let the network decide how to transform that information, or you can do both at the same time. And so these things is not really interesting when you not use the, the second point that I mentioned before, these points. But if you use it in combination with the second one, you can get a lot uh, of value and a, a huge improvement. Can I ask a question here as well? Yeah. So basically the idea would be that um, 
when you say we know the let's say given we know the perfect motion due to some other sensors of um of our robot or whatever films yeah um when you talk about shifting the feature map where would that happen in the whole pipeline would it happen before inside or the network so the the transformers have t as those uh, um positional encoding that yeah. gives the network some kind of information about the location of the token so okay. if you know that you are sliding like this you can slide all your position along the ending so that the network will know that the position is no different and you can then let the network decide on what was the good transformation to do okay and when you say when you talk about learning this transformation or this slide or shift yeah. um what kind of data do you rely on to learn that so you would have like ground truth data that would actually give you yeah you, you have to rely on on video uh, data sets uh, so I mean, it depends on the context, but there is a lot of uh, either real data sets or uh, synthetic data sets that give a lot of different length sequences on which we can rely on. But do you need for the, you also need the positional data for those uh, video data sets? If, if you have it, that's better. If you don't, the network will learn it by itself. That's why it can be a two, two way, like, like you have, have two pathways. Your network can yep. learn it yep. uh, or you can have, strongly in, uh, give that prior to the model. But how would it learn the uh, shift by just predicting how it would look in the next frame and then you compute the loss between e that? Or e Exactly. I mean, if you okay. ask your network to come up with a transformation that yeah. will transform and shift all the embedding and you have a loss at the end, the, okay. the only way for the network is to deduce this transformation. Okay. Cool. No, I mean, this makes total sense that... Uh, I mean, from, from a human perspective, it makes a lot of sense since this is yeah. exactly what we do. The, we only update our representation. We don't compute each, everything each time again. And well, that's, that, that's why it's extremely powerful to do that yeah. kind of thing. Cool. Okay. Um, so just an intermediate summary of what we have talked about up to now. Uh, we have focused basically on how to reduce the computation of this VIT block that, that was one of the main things that was taking time on our models. That was not the only one. Like the ResNet is, can, be, can be packaged very efficiently, but there is still a lot of things that we can improve on this backbone. Like, like maybe we don't need a ResNet. Maybe if we rely on a smaller network, like, like a mobile net, we can go even faster when we're going in real time. But if we rely on the smaller network, of course, we're going to lose a lot of performance. Uh, we're not going to be as good as for, for predicting depth for, with only one image. Uh, and, but the main reason is that using only semantic to learn depth perception is extremely hard. I mean. As human beings, we rely on so many things to, to, to get depth information. Here we have the network to, to rely only on the color value, blur, texture, and perspective, and so on. So if we reduce the backbone, we have to leverage some other mechanisms as well so that the network can have less to do on the backbone but so that it can rely on other mechanisms to compensate for this lack of, of parameters. So uh, one way that we can uh, try to, uh, uh, by using only monocular perception, we can try to get depth information is by using what's, what we call optical expansion. So here is, uh, so I just listed uh, one paper that is doing that. This is, there is not a lot of paper doing that, by the way. Um, it's upgrading optical flow to 3D sense flow through optical expansion. So what this paper is doing is that it's using optical flow. Uh, so this is the motion of each pixel in the scene. And from optical flow, what you can do is to deduce uh, an optical expansion, with, which is from one particular location in the image. Does its part is it's scaling like this, or does it scaling like this? And if you know how does each part of the image scale, you can then deduce uh, depth information. In these papers, they, they're deducing uh, 3D sense flow, but from 3D sense flow, you can have depth information as well. So yeah, that's so this mechanism. You can only rely on, on this mechanism if you have a move on, on, on your axis, on, on the main axis, like the, here. If you're moving on, on, on the, on, in a lateral movement like this, you, you, you can't re uh, rely on op optical expansion. You, you, you can only use optical expansion if you're moving uh, in front of you. So that's one way we can get depth. 
another way is to use motion products. So this is the other way, like a, um, optical expansion give you depth if you go in that direction. But if you go in, uh, in lateral direction, if you use motion products, and it's like kind of the same thing as using stereo a stereo setup. Like you have two lens close to, together, and so you have a baseline between those two depths. And if you get disparity, so you get the matching between one lens and another one, then you can deduce depth. Motion paradise is the same thing, but the difference is that your camera, your first camera is time t, your second camera is time t plus one, and you might not be perfectly aligned. You might be like this instead, or you might be like this, or maybe you can be like this. But what matters is the disparity between the two images. And if you get this disparity, then you can get depth information. So what you have to rely on is on the ego motion of, of your robot, if you have some kind of ego motion. And if you deduce this disparity, uh, it's like a solo called epipolar geometry. It's relying on the epipolar geometry to do that. And if you do that, then you have disparity and you have depth information if you move in that direction. So now we have two mechanisms, optical inspection and motion paradox that we can use to deduce depth when we move into the scene or when something is moving in front of us. And what great things is that when we rely on those two, uh, two type of mechanisms, we can solve the, the ambiguity that we had before uh, with the scale and shift, because now we have some information about it's like ground truth because I mean not ground truth but like real world information about how does the scene is, is scale and shift properly and so the mo the prediction that was coming from the monocular model that one rely only on semantics cannot be updated so that we can get a, a real uh, prediction that we can use in in real in real time and one thing I, I do not mention here is that because we, we so, so now we can reduce the size of the backbone because we can also give new information to the to the networks that are coming from the op optical expansion and from the parallax so that the network can have already some prior about how the scene is made and can just basically update the scene to to make it more usable in, in real world situations to, to re make regulation on some part of the image and we can then solve this uh, this scale and shift ambiguity. Um, now we have a model that is fully optimized and we, and, and we hope that we can run it in production properly. Well, that's the end. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, any, any questions, remarks, ideas, um, so on? Otherwise, I can do some, but I think I already asked some questions. I do have some questions. Perfect. Uh, that, that was a very good presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, and for me, it's really nice because I don't have a lot of experience with 3D and I want to get in this field. That's why I joined the, mm -hmm. the meeting. Uh, but one question that I have, when you were talking about monocular depth, yeah. uh, can you retrieve the depth map only from one image or you always need a video to, to retrieve the depth map? So structure for motion, for example. Uh, yeah, if so you one image, you, you retrieve the depth map. So motion products I was talking here is depth from motion. So you have to so you have to use two image. So that's based on those two image and use it using a people geometry, you can then retrieve the depth. The network I was talking at the beginning, uh, the the one based on transformers, uh, this one was uh, was relying only on on one image. That was the, a backbone of VIT blocks only with one image. And this is why you can't know the scale and the shift of the scene. You have some ambiguity. Exactly. So if, if I need, if I have a problem where I need to have the real distance with just one image, it's not possible, right? So that's no, it, it, with only one image, you need some external prior uh, about the world so that you can deduce the, the size uh, or the distance of the objects. Mm -hmm. Like one way you can do it is to have a strong, very strong prior on the object that you're looking. Like let's say you are on the road, you're doing a ADAS system for autonomous vehicles. 
well, if you see a vehicle and you know the size of the roughly the size of the vehicle and you know the distance, uh, I mean, you you see how how big the the object is, then you can know uh, the real depth. But this is relying a lot on semantic, and so this is very specific to to one given distribution of data. So if you want to be agnostic to the distribution or be more general, then you you need some extra external prior. Nice. Thank you. That was very helpful. Okay, I will uh, start. I have some, I mean, thank you again for the presentation. Really liked it. I uh, also liked how you went over like some ideas. Okay, how when we go from research where we could go further. I have um, some questions more regarding to the hardware side. So at the beginning, you said on the smaller uh, Jetson board, maybe you can yeah. open the slide again. Um, you can go up to 10, um, like the one, the nano where you say it's work in progress. Do you use, apart from quantization, do you use any other techniques to make it um, work? Or do you even use quantization? We, uh, yeah, we already use quantization. So the, the thing that you see on the left, do not use quantization. So there is still okay. room for improvements yeah. uh, on that one, especially on the on the ResNet uh, architectures. Um, like like the, one, the, the, the time when we tried quantization, we had a network with a lot of back and forth, with a lot of outputs and going from uh, quantize to uh, flood 16, uh, a lot of time where Kind of consuming a lot and so it was roughly the same as running the networks uh, or uh, without quantization yeah. only with float 16. okay um and like i was wondering do you have any maybe you have a rough guess on how much like the results suffer from the step to quantization i mean obviously i think they will get a bit worse at least would you say um you have a guess on yeah. how much well, that is i think what we have to care about when we do those kind of analysis is the metrics that we use to see how much we lose. Yeah. Because if, if you lose a lot of accuracy for uh, objects that are very far away from you, you don't really care. What you yeah. really want to be sure about is that you uh, you keep a lot of accuracy for the things that are in front of you and that you really have to avoid or be sure about. And so if you train your neural, your neural network in, in a good manner, you can maximize the, the performance of the of the models on those parts. And therefore, when you're going to run the quantization, you, you can keep a very good accuracy on those parts of the image while losing some information on some others. But yeah, you can have a, 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 a ones, good balance between yeah. both. No, yeah. that's, no, that's totally something we've encountered as well as when we tried different models and uh, we like played around with different architectures is that when you just look at the raw um, yeah. For example, MAP score that it might be quite misleading if you don't check the results itself because yeah. then it's some like cars which are like 50 meters away which are not correctly detected, but the yeah. ones that are actually important, as you mentioned, are. Yeah. Um, and then I was wondering, so you, I mean, as you mentioned, you train it on video data. Do you have a like also a private data set or data set with, within your company? Or do you think like for your task, uh, the publicly available data sets like, I don't know, YouTube Voss and they might be the kitty ones you use um, are enough? We, 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 have, we have both. Like we okay. have public data sets, but we're also working uh, in a partnership with other companies that provide some other data sets that they have. So we mix both at, at the end. Okay. And then those, but, um, but I, I, I guess that you can already you can get. I mean, you can get ninety to ninety five percent of the of the, the the performance just by using publicly available data sets. Okay, yeah, that I was wondering whether. Yeah, okay. thank you. I, I was also wondering about the the kind of working range uh, because I mean, um, stereo cameras typically have a working range where they say the precision at, for example, two centimeters is yeah. max five, six, eight meters, depending on the size of the camera. And for the very small ones, for example, that we embed from the yeah. real sense ones, we're looking at uh, maybe a six meters range where we have a good precision. Yeah. Do you know if like there is on, on the kind of applications you're using, what kind of distances are you talking about? And is there a way to think of it as, as a, a way to expand the, the, the performance uh, when we look at further um, objects? Yeah, so that's a great question. So there's two ways to answer. Uh, 
let me go back yeah here so the first one which is not this one this is the semantic models if you if you rely on semantics the semantic is going to try to make something looks great so even though you're not going to be good far away you're going to be kind of consistent that's the first thing i mean it, it gonna looks okay even though everything will not be correct for stereo camera what if you want to see further away you want to increase the baseline like if you have a small baseline you're gonna see very close to you but not for, further away if you have a, a, a huge baseline you're gonna see a lot uh, far away that's why self-driving cars use, use baseline because they, they want to see vehicles 30 or 40 meters away so if you use motion parallax it all depends of how your robot is moving and we, which keyframe do you use if your robot is moving in that direction let's say this movement so you have a uh, some kind of baseline to use so the question is do you run the motion parallax model um every two milliseconds so the baseline is going to be extremely short so you're not going to see a, a, a extremely far away but if you use a good baseline you can maybe you can improve the the the, the precision for further for far away objects because you have virtually increase your baseline does it make sense yeah yeah it does perfectly yeah um and uh, and another question that i had was regarding the kind of backbone architecture that you're using in your experiments um yeah. i was curious like whether you you've tried uh, like the recent yolo v5 ones or if you're onto a bit lighter uh uh ones like What's what's your what's your usually your go to? I mean, for things you can disclose, but what's your your go to approach if you? Well, we we try most of the. I mean, what what what's great thing about op opening models on GitHub is that we can very easily switch from one backbone to another. So we we do not do uh, run a lot of experiments on how which model is. The, I mean, which backbone is the best. So we use ResNet as the as the baseline, and then when we have to to run more efficiently, then we use EfficientNet or MobileNet, for example. Okay. Okay. But but for, on our side, this is really a lot, not a lot of uh, of works to switch from one to another. Yeah. yeah. And, and maybe then one final question regarding the kind of applications that you're you have um, in in um, um, in the, at visual behavior. Um, what kind of constraints do you have? Um, sometimes I guess might be like size of the embedded hardware or anything that would make you go for monocular depth estimation uh, estimation rather than playing around with a stereo camera where where would the constraints come from uh, is it like from the customer level or is it on your but, side yeah from the the way that we see vision at, at visual behavior on the why we are doing those type of architecture is that we want to we think that one way of getting good results for high level robotics application is to get a scene representation that we can use to go on to those high level skills. Like if you, basically if you have one networks for predicting objects, one networks for predicting depth, and you try to mix all of those to get a good tracker, for example, let's say. Uh, well, you're gonna have good results and it's gonna be a lot correlated with the, the efficiency of your detector models on your depth, but the network doesn't have the ability to fuse that information itself. So the way that we move forward is by trying to mix all those information so that this is why I was listing all the things that we do as human beings to perceive a scene. Because by mixing all of that, we can create a coherent representation of the world and we can leverage that representation to access high level um, world understanding or yeah, predicting objects and so on, building occupancy map for robotics, those kind of application. Okay, okay. And um, sorry if I may like um, one, one final question on the on the kind of approaches that companies, for example, like um, I don't know if you're familiar with Coma uh, AI, yeah. yeah, like the kind of self-supervised approach where I guess there is no explicit moment where they compute a depth map for obstacle um, detection. I just want to get your yeah. Idea. I mean the, the 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 way Coma is doing is by going directly from the perception. I mean from the raw image information to the action yeah. so there is nothing in the, there is kind of there is almost nothing in the middle this is going from the raw data to the actions yeah. so we we do not exactly do that since what we do is that we create this representation and we 
try to maximize the performance of that representation so that we can use it for various applications. Yeah. Um, so that's how we, dif we differ from Comai in the approach that we do in computer vision. So we are more closely related with the way that Tesla is doing with their cameras because they, are, they have very di a different pipeline between the perception and the motion control and action. They have different things. This is two separate things for them. Uh, because they first build that representation with all the cameras, and then they use that representation to perform the motion planning and the control. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the the scope really of visual behavior is to try to keep that high level representation as consistent as com and complete as possible, and then you have a couple of downstream tasks. Uh, it's yeah. Not like yeah, okay. No, got it. Exactly. Thank you very much for the answers. To piggyback on to sorry to piggyback on the um, like using the, the small baseline to have a, a good accuracy close range and then a bigger one to have a better one a further range could you combine those two we would take three three shots at three different timestamps to being super close and then a further one away as the robot is moving away to have like good accuracy yeah. so you can do two different things you can as you said combine different uh, keyframe one close and one further away but you can also combine motion parallax with semantic plus optical expansion because optical expansion is if you have something that is coming into you which is what you care about uh, optical expansion would be very good for that for detecting those things so by having a, a, a huge baseline you will miss the opportunity to see things close to you but uh but optical ex expansion and semantic ca can take care of doing those things Thank you, and thank you for the talk. Thanks. I was also wondering if you had, um, and this is the path that you've taken that, that worked in the end. Do you have any uh, other, I'm sure you had to explore a lot of different uh, approaches. Is there any that uh, you tried and you, you had a lot of hope in it and the end it didn't work out and uh, you had to find another clever way? Um, it's more, but yeah, I mean, there is a lot of things that we tried that did not work at all, uh, for sure, but it was most of, uh, on, um, how, I mean, what I introduced here was the high level information about how we can leverage multiple uh, mechanisms. Those mechanisms, we know that those mechanisms exist and we know that this is great mechanisms to use. The question is how exactly to use it. So we did not have one mechanism that we have selected and we, we realized that it was not the good one, but we had a, a lot of struggle on using these mechanisms and finding the way that we can use this mechanism and, and, and mix this mechanism with other mechanisms so that we can get good depth information. And here we tried a lot of things and we failed on, on a lot of different things. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, normal when you start to innovate. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the thank you for the answer. Thanks. Okay. If there are no more questions, anybody? Yeah. No, I think then I can just uh, finalize here. Uh, thanks again to you, Tivo. Great presentation. Really uh, good insights. Um, yeah. Very Thanks happy to have you here. here. For your question. Yeah. And um, just as a, a little like look up for you all for the future, um, we're going to continue with this uh, series. Um, we'll, the plan is to do it once a month. Um, and we already have a next talk, which will go a bit more. Paul is also here. Uh, yeah, the one shaking. It will be a bit different. It will be about how we can uh, maybe substitute at one point um, neural networks or maybe even uh, vision transformers with a more physical approach, but I'm not going to spoil it too much here. And uh, I'm going to send around more information about that. And this uh, next talk will be on the 9th of March at the same time. So uh, if you want to keep update, get updates and um, stay in touch, just sign up on the website. Um, and yeah, thank you very much again. And I wish you all a great evening. Thanks a lot.